Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achint. A lot of times we ask this question about Pakistan. What in the world is this country? Why was it made? And guys, those of you who watched my last episode in Pakistan, I had said something very, very interesting. And I got a lot of hate mail from Pakistan from that. I had said, and I'm going to repeat myself, Pakistan did not get independence. It was created. So the next time August 14 comes across, we say happy creation day to Pakistan rather than the Independence Day greetings that I don't think many of us actually give. But in any case and scenario, what was the purpose of Pakistan? Why was it actually created? We'll discuss with a budding new friend of mine, Mr. Arindam Mukherjee, who is just like myself, as a matter of fact, an observer, an enthusiast and geopolitics, just like myself, is not his profession. He's a concerned citizen, if I may. And of course, I've heard and seen what he writes about various different issues. And I'm quite enthusiastic to bring him on the platform. So firstly, thank you so much and welcome to the show. Thank you, Adi. Thanks for having me. Namaskar to everyone, whoever's listening. It's good to be here. Absolutely, it is. Uh, so, you know, uh, I let's open the discussion with... Why was Pakistan made? What is the game behind Pakistan? You know, it's it's such a weird little creation. And I remember this uh, this uh, show that was I, I don't know if you remember and uh, the Homeland, which was a pretty old show. I love that. Out. I love yeah. that. One and of my you know top order favorite uh, series, television series ever made. Yeah. So th there's there's an interesting dialogue in that uh, about Pakistan where. This director of the CIA is trying to push somebody not to go into Pakistan and do some work and stuff like that. And he says, you know, it's not even a country. It's a, uh, you know what, acronym. And yeah. uh, why was it created? What was the requirement of this, this entire thing? A lot of people believe the fact that, you know, this Hindus could not stay with Muslims and Muslims could not stay with Hindus. And that's the reason why this was created. But is that so? No. I mean, not, not as per my understanding and as far my understanding of the creation of Pakistan is concerned or my understanding of the concept of geopolitics and different geopolitical theories are concerned. Pakistan, uh, to put it in a nutshell, was created because uh, the Anglosphere, the Western power, wanted to stop and wanted to put a limit to the Soviet Union expansion. Okay, now there is a whole big story behind it. So we can talk about it. But as I said, in a nutshell, Pakistan was a wedge. It was created. It was created in a very strategic location. Because my question, as you, if you've read my article, my question, the very first question that I ask is that you know, a Delhi to Dhaka stretch housed more number of Muslims than the northwestern frontier, and the northwestern frontier had very solid credentials in the shape of Bacha Khan and Sikandar Hayat Khan. Hmm. Sikandar Hayat was a, I mean, out and out secular guy. Bacha Khan ko leke, I don't think we need to say anything. Sikandar Hayat was influenced by Lord Lilith ko. Uh, Bacha Khan, you know, fell at one side when Congress suddenly decided not to be a part of the government because of some internal politics, which we can discuss. Um, and that is how instead of a Delhi to Dhaka stretch, Pakistan landed up being, being where Pakistan today is. Uh, that was orchestrated and that was the result of um, absolutely top order British cunning and British geopolitical intelligence put to play uh, at a time when India was pretty much the you know large sections of India which includes the political leadership of India was also largely ignorant about the about about the rules of engagement and about the powers that were shaping the rest of the world. Interesting that you say that, you know, one of the biggest things that I find about Pakistan is the voting that actually happened. And guys, we are, we are, we are just, you know, we want to get into the geopolitics and remember one thing about every time I think we've discussed geopolitics, history is a very important thing that we need to look at before we get into understanding the current, right? So we're not going to get into Imran Khan and Asim Munir. We might in, in the future because that's, I think, a symptom of the disease, but Let's understand the voting did not happen in the areas that is currently known as Pakistan. 
the voting yeah. happened in a totally different space so why was this particular place place chosen okay so this will take us back to the concept of the great game we are free to travel into that region absolutely okay. let's go okay so so great game was actually also called great game was a term which was popularized by rudyard kipling it actually was called uh, the tournament of shadows um by the russians and that's how it came to be known as now this tournament of shadow or great game was a uh, was a massive power play between russia imperial russia and later on soviet union and the british kingdom uh, it lasted for close to 200 years in its in its great game shape in its avatar that we call great game uh, and the result of which uh, the result of which was uh, you know a, a, was that the soviet union gained several million square kilometers of territory in the central asian landscape and the british india gained several million square kilometers of territory in the indian subcontinent because the time when great game had started um uh, wellesley was there as the governor general and he was sitting in calcutta and uh, uh, british east india company only had calcutta madras and bombay what wellesley did was wellesley overplayed the power the fear of russian the anxiety of russian expansion to his headquarter bosses in london and he quickly quickly expanded and he he is the guy who started the frontier policy the forward policy not the frontier policy the forward policy of british india and so british india which was only there in calcutta madras and bombay uh, became a, a, a humongously big entity which spread all the way from rangoon to peshawar okay this was the result of overplaying the anxiety behind the thought of oh my god russia is expanding so they will reach us mm-hmm. they'll come and they'll hit our crown in the jewel jewel in the crown i'm sorry okay as far as russian expansion is concerned russian russia had a massive uh, you know a, a, a kind of a central asian mongol if you speak if you if you allow me to say a central asian hangover because mm-hmm. russia was laid uh, i mean they made russia wasteland for 200 years the the central asian the mongol the golden hordes and when russia started exerting itself when russia started asserting itself and started pushing back yeah over a period of time russia had this major fear of central asian step nomads coming and overrunning them time and time again now they were sufficiently strong and now they were an industrial power and now they were a growing industrial power they wanted to put a stop to it so central asia sort of became russia's backyard and as any expansionist power that they would expand into central and russia is a land expansionist power okay like the way england was a maritime uh, you know uh, colonial influencer russia was a land expansion expansionist influence so it was only quite natural for russia to start ex- pandic into the eurasian landmass and when you have this two you know big elephants two mammoths two godzillas expanding in asia one is british india and one is russia there's bound to be a time when two of this would you know reach a point where they're seeing eye to eye so that's the funda of great game basically now why was pakistan why is pakistan there where it is where it is today is see when russia was expanding one of the major concern that russia has was that russia did not have access to warm water ports russian ports are like you know they remain frozen throughout the year only like remain operational a couple of months a year and they are mostly around the north sea north like close to north pole area the only access russia had the warm water port access that russia had which would bring them closer to where the main action area was black sea black sea port and black sea the port is today yeah where the war is today right and black sea port is something which the russians did not get uh, very easily there was a very prolonged problem which they had with the ottomans then the british were needling them during uh, uh, during the caucasian war when the british mm. people were in fact that was a precursor to afghanistan okay the guy in command there was a lord called lord urkuart okay david urkuart 
and david urquart was the guy who was the charlie wilson of 18th century you could say so he would take money he would take arms and ammunitions and he would take everything from england and he would go and supply them to the chechen to the yeah, to the dagestani and the uh, caucasian warrior uh, uh, the the rebels fighting under imam shamil and the caucasian uh, caucasia bled russia for quite some time eventually russia overcame caucasia because russia was a huge power mm. and thus russia could procure its access to black sea the next thing that russia wanted was they wanted an access to indian ocean and arabian sea the persian and gulf it, and the persian no persian gulf was difficult but arabian sea hmm. okay through that karachi balochistan thing persian gulf became a little complicated because of the second world war and because both england and russia had equal influence on persia during the second world war when they were fighting as allies against germany but abhi kya chahiye we have an access to black sea so we have access to the mediterranean sea through black sea once we have an access to i'm talking about russia once we have an access to the arabian sea or an indian ocean then imagine russia becomes a continent by itself so right from up there from an access to north pole right up to the place where the continental shelf ends which is arabian sea indian ocean russia would have an access to that okay now that was a that was a that was that was a situation where the british could not ever allow to happen hmm. so the prime objective was to cut russia's access to the black day to to indian ocean how to cut russia's access to indian ocean now we have a northwest frontier which thankfully has uh, 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 you know now that we have a sikandar hayat we, who we have subverted now we have a frontier gandhi gandhi abacha khan who has been dumped by the congress what adds us what what adds things in our kitty what makes northwest frontier score a few extra points a because uh, we have created the khyber bolan railroad the cream of british army is stationed in rawalpindi we have created that gilgit to uh, to to shinjiang highway which is the karakoram highway now to tashkurkan and all okay so we have the we have all the mountain passes which are covered so we have central asia which is being watched from all side all side possible so we reach till shinjiang we have kashmir covered we have uh, 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 a khyber uh, uh, you know uh, guns at khyber and guns at atok which was chanakya's frontier policy which later became akbar's frontier policy which later became british frontier policy we have afghanistan which is a wasteland nobody i mean you can move into afghanistan you cannot stay in afghanistan they'll chase you out they knew it by that time they had fought two wars with afghanistan and none of them ended too well for them so you have a neat stretch of land which if created and if you see pakistan ka width nahi hai pakistan is a long, long country it's a elongated stretch of land it mm -hmm. doesn't have width because width was not the need of the r the need of the r was that there's only one sliver of land which is there which can allow if it becomes if it remains a part of india assuming pakistan becomes pakistan in a delhi to dhaka stretch okay let's it's say pointless then there's no point because then india has got then the geographical entity or the political entity called india has access to northwest frontier has access to uh, arab Central asia so, russia yeah 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 so that was one of the reason which not many people uh, talk about uh, one exceptional book is there narendra singh sarila's uh, shadow of the great game uh, which i would uh, request the readers to read if they're interested so that was I mean, to open up, that was why Pakistan and how Pakistan got created. That's interesting, and you know, we also see just after the creation of Pakistan, there is also that deal where Gwadar was taken over for a measly sum of some fifty-six, fifty-seven million uh, dollars, and that was a very strategic port, and that port was allowed to be bought over by the Pakistanis. And mind you, to all the listeners, Gwadar was not a part of Pakistan; it was a part of Oman. since oman had a civil war and a crisis and they needed money at that time they kind of sold this port to or they were made to sell this port to <laughs> sell this sell port this to. 
uh, that's something which is important. So now and, that and, and creating and creating Balochistan also, they were part of the Persian Empire. Yeah. Okay. Because Balochistan, if you hadn't added, if you hadn't added up Balochistan, that part of Balochistan with Pakistan, then again there was this factor of the Soviet Russian Soviet Union trying to gain an entry from there. Okay. From Iran and you know that yeah, like. from Persia and into this. So let me ask you this: uh, the, You made Pakistan, right? You you wanted to stop Russia, and there was not much of an angle of India at that time. Of course, the angle of India was keep India and Russia away because these two guys joined together will become a crazy problem for us. Uh, the question that I want to ask you that was the hostility towards India or between India and Pakistan, you know, in your opinion, was it created or was that a happy coincidence for the West? I would say 50-50. I would say 50-50 because, um, again, going back to my two examples of Sikandar Hayat and uh, Bacha Khan, these guys hmm. were uh, the, the political leaders of two provinces, Northwest Frontier province, which was uh, predominantly Muslim. But they were, Bacha Khan was a Congress representative and he was ruling at a time when it was gradually being known that Congress is a Hindu party, Congress is a Hindu party. Such was the propaganda. And yet these people did not have a problem with a Congress guy called Bacha Khan ruling, uh, you know, being their elected representative. And the second thing is Sikandar Hayat went on record to say that, you know, Jinnah is trying to start a problem. He is trying to pit Hindus against Muslims and Muslims against Hindus. And probably he is being supported. I am not sure, but probably he is being supported by the Brits. Uh, there is no reason why I should see myself as a part of that uh, campaign of Jinnah. This Sikandar Hayat went on record and said. So, uh, even though there were problems there, but there were provinces and there were territories which were doing quite well during that point in time. Okay. Mm. The Brits saw uh, an opportunity which they materialized. That is one part. Okay. Yes. You see, there's two separate entities which are always there, which were always there. So you had Hindu entity and your Muslim entity. And yes, they were there, but they were, they had never assimilated and were living as one. Okay. They were clubbed very close to each other and they were coexisting. Sometimes there were problems, which is a normal, uh, thing to happen and sometimes there was no, there was no problem what the british realized is that if you look at the time first world war was the time when the ottoman empire sort of ended okay and even though the british the allied forces were the ones responsible for the end of ottoman empire because the british helped in creation of saudi arabia and iraq and jordan they became massively popular amongst the Muslim uh, Ummah around the world. Okay. They wanted... Now, if you look at Britain, if you, if you try to analyze this from the British perspective, from the British point of view, you are looking at a situation, you're looking at a scenario when it's like, let's say, 1920s and 1930s. Oil is coming into preeminence. Okay, you have the Standard Oils and the uh, Chevron Texas of the uh, Chevron and Mobiles of the world setting up offices everywhere. You have discovered that Middle East is sitting on oil. You are trying to endear yourself to Middle East. You have given, keeping that in mind, you have given uh, a Saudi Arabia, you've, you've created a Iraq, you've created a Jordan. You have an immense amount of popularity amongst the Muslims. And you have a certain... Uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who is there in the subcontinent, who, if you can cater to in a in a planned, in a coordinated fashion, you can create a current country which is not only going to ac stop Soviet access to warm water ports in Arab Sea, but it is also going to elevate your status in the Muslim world. Hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so you would do whatever you want to. If it calls for creating trouble between Hindu and Muslims, you would do that. If it mm -hmm. calls for creating trouble between a parent and his son or his or her daughter, you would do that. And this is precisely what they did. And that actually makes me kind of, uh, uh, you know, that kind of makes me wonder when I think about all of these things. You know, things are so different. I mean, these are like two absolutely different worlds. I'll try to explain. 
these are like two absolutely different world when you visualize you visualize the rest of the world during 1920s and 1930s and 1940s you have a halford mckinda who has already uh, you know presented his uh, geographical pivot of history yeah. you have alfred mahan who has already wrote his book on maritime primacy 1940s was the time when spikeman wrote about the 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 the, the rimland based on which this containment of soviet union was materialized you had this world the anglo world which is britain and france and uh, i mean anglo world nahi the european world pakad ke chalo the west pakad ke chalo britain and france and germany and even russia and united states so thoroughly well versed so thoroughly into this system of uh, global governance or running colonies or uh, you know uh, 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 um, exploiting different geopolitical philosophies and theories and practices to their advantage all for access and control and at the same time if at 1920s and 1930s if you look at what was happening in india we were like absolutely clueless about the changes that were happening in the rest of the world and not just us i mean theek hai yaar aam public would always be clueless let's assume that our political leaders were fairly clueless about the rest of the world the entire subcontinent i would actually add and that's 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 something which these people took advantage of yeah 1940 1939 world war started 1939 lord lalitko had a series of meeting with uh, mk gandhi where he was informed that you know we are we are requisitioning indian soldiers for the second world war and we need indian soldiers to fight and uh, gandhi was ambiguous he couldn't say a yes or a no but nehru objected vehemently saying no 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 we are not going to send so something happened the effect of which was lilitko said hey listen i am not asking for your permission i am informing you <laughs> okay so to which what happened is this guy started resigning from all their positions mm. and civil disobedience movement started the moment this guy resigned from well, the moment congress gave up its hold that was when uh, mohammed ali jinnah came into existence otherwise he was a non entity nobody knew him when there was this sudden sudden power vacuum this guy walks in and says i can help you sir and lilith goes he becomes lilith goes chappu and he becomes lilith goes pons and everything lilith go did was to do later on was to you know like put that gun on jinnah's shoulder and keep firing so keep firing. what i what i'm trying to say is that the kind of in hindsight of course i don't know maybe those guys thought that that was the best thing to do i am just being very you know formal here but in hindsight there was a serious amount of uh, political international political ignorance on the part of our leaders because yaar theek hai google nahi hai but you are the political stalwarts of the countries right if somebody by the name of nicholas spikeman has written a book which deals in detail the concept of heartland and rimland and world island and marginal crescent and kaun sa kya hai and what or what was okay what was russia's strategy for the last 200 years how did england become the maritime superpower that it was how is america were this were all being speculated in 1940s yep somebody should have read that and actually before that even i mean you have these discussions happening during the great depression where when so called when the entire world order was in a, in a in a gif and the americans yeah. were in 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 this uh isolationary mode people were talking about the entire game that is going to change in 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 across the world and when the hints of war were not there but then you know by the end of th- the early 30s you really knew that you're heading in for another fracas in yeah. europe uh let me ask you this so we 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 all know you know this is a great introduction to the 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 creation of pakistan we we've, we've kind of taken up that now we know what has happened in the past 70 years theek hai 70 75 years and i you know we can we can always refer to it but that's a that's a moot question and i think all the viewers who are seeing it right now and who will see it later do know what has happened in these this time post the uh, our independence and the creation of pakistan you know with the with the days difference and uh, how does it today have a relevance because and allow me just 30 seconds i i have you know as i as i spoke to you in the morning i find there are three different lifelines that the pakistanis have had because pakistan to me was a failed state right at the beginning right 
and this is not me saying this is many a books written within pakistan about their own history talk about it many a serious analyst within pakistan say yaar we didn't have it's anything it's a garrison state actually we didn't, we didn't have anything we didn't build up anything we didn't do anything yeah so they were, the the first lifeline was of obviously you know when they sat down with america they jumped into the laps nato ceto cento pento all these agreements they signed because they knew they had to get something from somewhere yaar kahin to paisa to aana chahiye kahin se of course gandhi gave them some 55 60 crores in this and that in those days different story all together but they needed more now that was the first lifeline the second lifeline was a big one 1979 when the iranian revolution happened things just exploded right so now yeah. iranian revolution happens the iran shia factor is becoming stronger the saudi say yaar oh oh but he send the wahabis inside send a lot of money create these madrasas create the mosques create this create that let's have a keep a control over this otherwise this thing is going out of our control and the same time the soviets decide to go into afghanistan the americans come in by 80s 81 80 81 they were already in uh, mm-hmm. physically but they were there in spirit if i may and in monetary benefits since actually 1975 uh the brzezinski in his book the great the 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 chessboard grand chessboard yeah. yeah the grand chessboard actually writes about the fact that they were sending in money to the tune of about a million or Uh, at the beginning and about 5 million by about 1975 into afghanistan to create an anti soviet narrative that, so that they can invite the soviets inside so exactly what they did with ukraine they did in in afghanistan that time hmm. now relevance then the third relevance came out when the 911 happened that was again a bloody this thing you had musharraf stand up guy i i believe bush used to call him right stand up guy Mm. so the third relevance happened now what what is the relevance of pakistan today ah oh. <laughs> <laughs> see see in the along the same lines that you're saying that you just now explained very nicely chronologically pakistan remains relevant along the same lines because see to understand if you if somebody really wants to understand pakistan from this point of view you have to objectively view pakistan as a garrison state so you have an army which incidentally is sitting on a piece of land a piece of real estate and it gives two hoots to the people that are living there it can exploit them it is free to exploit them the way it wants to so you have the 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 non state actors and the terrorist and the and the breeding of radicals the acting as the hr manager when afghan jihad was there okay so somebody is putting in the money somebody is putting in the weapons all you need to do is recruit and train these guys and you know get their induction program done and push them into the battlefield in afghanistan so <laughs> so yeah use them as your uh, recruitment uh, uh, tools use them as you see fit you are an army which is sitting on a plot of land as long as you manage to do that you would always have your utility as a mercenary to whoever needs your services so you had a a a, a united states for ever needing pakistan because the threat of soviet union was there so it, it could have been through cento it could have been through uh, a, a a platform for launching the mujahideen and the jihadists it could have been uh, after 911 but all this while what was happening is united states had this thing you know about soviet union 911 ke baad thoda sa alag ho gaya which i will talk about if time permits because 911 ke time mein soviet union had ceased to exist it was just russia and russia had gone back to being like you know it was a very weak and a very poor kind of a state during those days hmm. it would take about 5 7 years to get back uh, uh 911 ke time mein getting pakistan in and in in george bush's efforts of global war on terror had another reason i'm sure you know it it is called the turkmen afghan pipeline yeah uh, okay the trans afghan pipeline which they were planning to build from turkmenistan into pakistan uh, so it was control of oil it was basically control of central asian uh, natural resources so, so, so. oil and gas being one of them so 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 because the strategic placement of pakistan i mean time and time again you would come and you would have to appreciate the importance of that that piece of land okay so as long as pakistan as long as access and control remains 
primary in the world of real politics or geopolitics, Pakistan is going to stay relevant. Now, is Pakistan going to remain in a position where, um, you know, all their generals have their villas in, uh, <laughs> you know, Dubai and London and New York and elsewhere and uh, sit on a lot of money and no questions asked? Is Pakistan going to remain like that? No. Two reasons behind it. One, United States is uh, not that... I won't say not that rich, but it's not in that kind of a frame where it could st where it could continue throwing around money, no questions asked. And number two, if you have ever had the experience of dealing with China, I have. I we've you know in 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 professional uh, career we have dealt with Chinese company. They are extremely extremely you know uh, money conscious, conscious. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, to 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 sort of arm twist China into throwing money on you like the way your U.S. masters did is going to be very difficult. Very difficult. Yeah. So, in the day, Pakistan still has utility to these two countries. I won't say country country as in United States. Let's say Pakistan has its importance to West because Pakistan is still sitting at a place where it is sort of lining itself against the underbelly of both China and Russia. And if you can create problems there, then both Russia and China would have their backyards filled with some, uh, you know, some problematic elements. And we have seen by their nature, radical Islamism is something which persists, you know, decades after decades after decades. So if you can ignite that, you can be rest assured, which you are not managing today in Ukraine, because it seems Ukrainians cannot fight on their own. And you have to keep pouring them weapons and you have to keep pouring them this and that. Otherwise, they simply just like, you know, would walk away from the battlefield it is not the case with the radical islamist yeah they can find their own resources they will find they their will own. Yeah. yeah they will they have done that so uh, today placing of an iskp an isis in the khorasan province today placing of an isis in khorasan becomes very important because tomorrow you might need that same isis now that taliban has lost their relevance now they are, you know, legit governments and things like that. There is a limit to what they can act as non-state actors. You have the ISIS uh, KP, which can be uh, fed, which can be fueled, which can be supplied with arms and weapons, and which can be let loose in Central Asia. So once Central Asia, you can needle both China and Russia, and you can do it indefinitely. Is Pakistan going to be a, a, a you know, a platform for that, a, a, a launching pad for that, or is Afghanistan going to be a launching for that pad for that? It remains to be seen. So the true terror factory, huh? Yeah, but Afghanistan is honestly trying to, you know, uh, you know take its hand off. Yeah, I mean, that's they something can... interesting. Right now, suddenly you get news that Afghanistan wants to reduce the poppy production. Yeah. And you know, the which, other day I was thinking, I said, yeah, he's reducing poppy production. Yeah. And 15 days later, Manipur explodes. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Hey, you're seeing the right things actually. You're you seeing know, the absolute right things. This is this is this is very interesting to me because both the places, if you see, there's the golden golden crescent and the golden triangle. Triangle, yeah. This is the place where, where the world's poppy goes from. You know, it's, it's not something which we need to take it. It can be disguised as cookie versus maiti and this and that. A whole lot of things can be done, which is the narrative of it. And a lot of Manipuris, I know a lot of people are following my channel. They get pissed off when I say this. But I think it's more to do with the opium game in the East. Now, coming back to the West, hmm. when the... Afghans say, yeah, bus, we are not growing opium anymore. We, I mean, we are reducing the opium production. And that's something which is officially this thing. And there are multiple videos of them burning these damn fields. Mm -hmm. Millions and millions of dollars. Yeah? I mean, they're just burning them down. Mm. That tells you their kind of pushback a little bit with regards to propagation of larger terror incidents and stuff like that. Which tells me that there is going to be a certain area of Pakistan which needs to be taken over for this nonsense to perpetuate. Which is where I see the TTP, which is actually inching into KP and, you know, Waziristan and Swat and all that area. 
as a very relevant move because they're not getting that space within Afghanistan fully anymore. So they need to get another space within Pakistan to create that thing that you're talking about, the, the, the factory that you're talking about. Because we don't see the terrorism reducing at all. The, 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 I mean, look at what's happening in France. There's obviously another angle to what is happening. We are looking at it as a race riot. I'm sure large part of it is. But there is another angle to this. So how do you see the recent developments in Pakistan where large swaths of land today are inaccessible to the army? What is that going to be used for in the, in the future? You spoke about ISIS. You spoke about ISKP. I'd add a little Mirchi Masala for my Chinese friends who are watching on the ETIM. Mm -hmm. What's happening all around here? Okay, so Afghanistan saying we are going to reduce poppy cultivation is a slap on the face of the CIA <laughs> because yeah, because uh, they are the ones that they are the guys that stand to gain the most from poppy cultivation. They are the guys that have been extremely careful in preserving the continuity of poppy cultivation the entire time they were in Afghanistan. If you remember After Taliban at one, yeah. yeah. After the surge, they let it grow. They just said, they, yeah. And one of the first places that were kicked out of the British and the, the American forces were kicked out of as Helmand. You know, they lost a very few tactical wars. They probably didn't lose a single tactical battle in Afghanistan, the US Army. Mm -hmm. But still, they had to leave. It's a different thing. The only one place where they were kicked out of is the Poppy Territory, Helmand Province. Now, if you remember the one time, the Taliban was the Taliban, incidentally, was the first, uh, you know, group of guys that burned down the poppy cultivation thing back when they came in power during the first time, if you remember that. So they are again trying to get back into a stage where they want the poppy cultivation to gradually phase out. Okay. That's one part of the story. What I am, where I would disagree with you a little bit is the TTP and all these guys gaining ground. They are not gaining ground because Afghanistan is uh, suddenly turned very good. Don't make the mistake of thinking that the Afghan Taliban and the Pakistani oh. Taliban are not linked. Sab, sab mile hue. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, yeah. So, the Pakistan Taliban or the Tariq Taliban Pakistan is gaining its foothold. It's trying to gain as much a foothold as possible in Pakistan because they don't recognize the Duran line. Itna kuch aajkal chal raha in Pakistan. If and there are virtually places inside Pakistan in the border area where the government's rules and regulations don't apply. They don't even okay. go there. Yeah. So if tomorrow those, I'm not saying a dramatic balkanization takes place and redrawing of political lines, etc., etc., takes place. But if tomorrow these regions are in effect, de facto controlled by an Afghan population, an Afghan warlord, an Afghan chieftain who swears allegiance to Kabul, is there anything else you can do? Nope. So that territory is more or less gone. So Tehrik Taliban Pakistan is probably not looking so much at finding their next source of income as much as they are looking at increasing their footprint in a geographical region, which they consider to be a part of Afghanistan. So that's 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 what is happening as far as uh, and Taliban the American, and, and the Americans gifted them six hundred thousand rifles for that. Oh yes, that was that was a mindless thing. In fact, we had I mean one of the chat shows with Arsha when I went. It, we conducted I think about a month and a half before Afghanistan ka ye this fiasco happened. I told that these guys will have to pack and leave, and that was a time when Afghan army was trying to put up a fight, and people were not even in a in a in that frame of mind to think that okay USA is going to evacuate Afghanistan. They did a mistake, and they, this and another another interesting thing which comes to mind is that there was a point in time when you had Kenan, when you had Kissinger, when you had Brzezinski, you had the top of the line, you know, political strategist and international strategist and diplomat which used to populate the United States uh, you know, uh, policy sphere. And today you have, I don't know what you have today. <laughs> you have the same guys, actually. No, you don't have the same guys. 
you still have Kissinger at the back end. Kissinger is the, the, Kissinger is dead and gone. Nobody listens to him. Like yeah, he sits yeah. there and he's ha. Huh. The thing is, Brzezinski is dead. Kenan is a Kenan is the guy incidentally who used to talk about American primacy and then before he died he said that you guys are making a mistake in expanding the borders right. of NATO. Now my thing is that there used to be top of the line ace planners who made United States the way United States was, who made it possible you know that the Cold War ended in a fashion which uh, which which ushered in the the era of unipolarity. Hmm. What happened to those? to that you know Thinkers. that IQ pool yeah that IQ pool of United States look at the planners today no the IQ pool to me has kind of shifted to globalist agendas okay. which is you know and that's where I, I bring to my next question is that there is a certain relevance to Pakistan but keeping a Pakistan the way it is today is not valuable right in the sense it's a it's 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 a nuisance it's not a compliant country especially when you look at it from the western perspective it's not a compliant country no it's if you say okay here's a billion dollars trouble india he won't i mean he will probably trouble india but he will do 50 other things and which may not be in the full mighty full clear interest of the west today which brings me to my question about Pakistan's future. Let's now get into that aspect of it. Considering the factor that the Americans and let's take it that they've literally armed <laughs> the TTP. <laughs> Part of the deal which was brought in by Zalil Khalizad was the factor that these TTP guys who were in, 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 in prison in Afghanistan needed to be released. So that was part of the deal that the Americans signed with the Taliban. Yeah. And on top of that, these guys leave 600,000 rifles and ready some 10,000 this and that and this and that. Whole bunch of stuff. Which of course, a lot of it is with the Afghan Taliban, but not come towards this side. The question that I'm asking is, is this now, this expansion of this, this sort of a terrorist land in the middle of Afghanistan and Pakistan, officially is a separate area altogether. It's emerging to be a separate area. You can call it Pashtunistan, you can call it Pakhtunistan, you can call it whatever you want. Mm. Now, is this part of a plan? Because this is also a strategic messaging to Pakistan. Listen, if you guys don't, you know, you, you've gone too far with China. You've gone too far with everything. This is what can happen to you. And to a lot of people who will say that the Americans don't have sway over Taliban uh, is not reported, but there is ISR activity happening out of Bagram even now with American specialists on the ground. Mm -hmm. So what's happening here? Because it's it's quite a crazy scenario which is emerging, and with with the suddenly Pakistan gets some money, but not enough to make it do anything, but just enough to make it survive. You know, it's just that listen, we can't deal with you right now. We are busy in Ukraine. You just survive. I don't care if a part of your bloody land goes. It's not my problem. You created this for yourself. So deal with it. Is this the message coming from the West towards Pakistan today? See, I would say even if this is the message that is coming to Pakistan, there is no saying which way the West is going to sway tomorrow. Because oh, yeah. if you remember... Because if you remember, there, there is a historical precedence to that. If you yeah. remember, ye, uh, when the uh, Soviet Union withdrew and walked out of Afghanistan, the United States, the, the entire CIA base up and disappeared. They just washed, took the hands of Pakistan. That money that was coming in all this 11 years that these guys were being bred and these guys were being trained and you had unleashed a jihadist network in Pakistan. United States was like, Khel khatam paisa ajam hum nikal gaya. They just upped and disappeared from Pakistan. Out? Yeah. And and that is because they did not have a follow-up follow plan. The jihadist movement sort of spilled out entire across the entire continent. If you look at that, that is where Pakistan started utilizing these people, sometimes in Chechnya, sometimes in Bosnia, sometimes in Central Asia, sometimes in Kashmir. We all know that. Rentiers. They were, yeah, the army is a rentier yeah. and these terrorists also rentiers. Yeah. 
like mm. because because again going back to our parlance you have recruited these guys you have fed them for such a long time usko to abhi to you have to sort of continue with them yeah what would you do you have to keep them employed so get them to go and fight wars here and there so this is what pakistan did that was the time when united states suddenly lost and its interest and took up why because my prime objective was soviet union soviet union is not there anymore who is pakistan i don't know any pakistan then when laden did that 911 and all of a sudden there was the refocus and you know uh, 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 the, the thing came back to afghanistan and iraq and whichever country they wanted to portray as the the great evil uh, the, the 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 focus came back to pakistan again they started quoting pakistan as if there is no tomorrow and then today they have again forgotten pakistan so there is no saying what is going to happen tomorrow there is a split in pakistan there is a section in pakistan that thinks it is in their interest to be aligned with united states there is a section of pakistan which thinks that it is in their interest to align themselves with china i believe till the time united states is busy with ukraine war and trying to open up another front against china and taiwan etc etc they would probably want this two to play out in between themselves ki bhai tum decide kar lo if at the end of it if we have the time and we still have that interest where it is in our interest to destabilize central asia for uh, 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 to prevent a china and a russia from growing then we might think of focusing back on pakistan not before that i don't think they have a strategy in place they would create a strategy if it comes to that so keep it on life support yeah 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 as you said ki yaar you take your 3 billion dollars and you know just see me in 6 so, months <laughs> yeah we'll catch you up after 6 7 months <laughs> and make sure you get your blood test reports and your free x rays <laughs> and- <laughs> yeah So uh, let's 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 kind of round this discussion up before we get into the audience questions. There are loads of comments, but guys, two hundred and fifty plus people watching. Yeah, we got what fifty? Wait, hang on. We got less likes. Come on, eighty-four likes. Yeah, come on. We can do better than that. Just a little touch on the bottom of the screen. You know, encourage uh, who's a new speaker on Dev Talks. I think he's 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 done a wonderful job in terms of bringing out a hidden history. and that's something that we need to discuss this is the reality of geopolitics guys the reality of geopolitics are not stuff that is actually <laughs> written and spoken it is the stuff that is understood about the and, written and, and spoken and you know the kind of influence that it has i mean i am amazed when people when i read makinder and when i read spikeman and mahan and when i look at everything that the west has been doing so far has been completely or based on their theories and based on their oh, yeah. uh, and so so to me aaj ke din mein whatever is happening whichever country is getting affected in whichever way good way or bad way these are all the results of all this house of uh, rudolf kichel and, and then this guy who coined the concept of levenstrom frederick frederick ratzel ratzel that state is a state is a living entity and it has to grow if it shrinks it is dead which sort of led germany into the uh, that expansion mode <laughs> so uh, everything has been is 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 predicated on this few guys and what they wrote about geopolitics and the theories and the practices and people talk talk so less about them that's something which i find pretty surprising yeah because uh, see the factor is that the dumbing down of the narrative has been done by a lot by the media right it is all about tactical situations i mean if you if you look at twitter after this 3 billion dollars was given to pakistan everybody so pissed off but you look at the larger geopolitical perspective that just been given enough to survive mm. and i and i covered this in a show where i said yeah they have to pay 3.7 out they've got 3 3 in how do that kind of make sense because Walks the guys yeah. less less 700 billion dollars as it is so they can keep pounding the bangras and shabash sharif can probably buy a new suit but is not going to make a damn of a difference to the entire thing uh and that's something which is very amazing to me that even when you have a change in leadership which probably the us wanted as far as imran khan was concerned and i'm going to guess a lot of the pakistanis that will watch this the americans did not want imran khan to be there now i don't know if donald lu had written that cipher and this and that i don't know about all that but 
I don't think the Americans really wanted that guy there because he was getting a little too big for his own boots. Uh, especially if you look at it, you know, the arrogance which was coming out at that time. Now, they got what they 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 wanted in terms of a softer, mellower Shabazz Sharif. But still, there has been no engagement. And which is what brings me to this, this, this big thing that the engagement today is left to the UK, which, of course, controls a large part of the financial market. The insurance market, and you know, there's a whole whole other story to that. They are going to influence the Americans to kind of keep this entity alive because it it you know politically speaking within the UK, there is a lot of calling for Pakistan because of the roots and this and that and the other. Uh, this is the first generation, you know, the first guy generation guys who went there. They still have that Pakistani yearning and stuff like that. By the time it's Next 20 years, when their children are out, they're not going to care because none of those chaps have even been here. How do you see the handling of Pakistan going forward, let's say, in the medium term? Why I ask this is because the shift towards Asia is happening. Right? We can see that with all the stuff which is happening with regards to China. Now, when that shift to Asia comes in, Pakistan will have to make a choice. And I've mentioned this on this platform before. It'll have to make a choice, either China or Pakistan. You also just brought it up. Now, will there be a scenario where the West turns around and tells Pakistan, listen, dude, <laughs> we've had enough of you. You need to either be this way or that way. You can't, you're either with, with us or against us. You know, the Pakistanis hate that question. What happens then? Oh God. The first question that I would think then is that, is the West ever going to ask that to Pakistan? You know, in order for the West to be in a position mm -hmm. to ask that question to Pakistan, the West needs to be sitting on a set of advantages. Now, again, bring the geo or geopolitics back in the picture. You have a... St okay, if in the meantime, Pakistan breaks down into several sections, that's a different thing. But assuming the fact that it remains as a continuity, as a as a geographical continuity between the Arabian Sea and Central Asia, Afghanistan, let's say. Are you in a position to call up Pakistan and say, dudes, let's do it my way or else, you know, you, you take the exit road. Are Jai you in a position? Uh, or as if you are in a position, then you've got to have been uh, got to have prevailed. I'm talking about the West. If the West is in that position, then the West got to have prevailed over Russia and China. Do you see that happening? I don't know why. Because can I just interrupt you? Because they they yes, lost please. face in in, in 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 Afghanistan when they ran away. Mm -hmm. It didn't take them six months to create another issue. So mm -hmm. they might just lose in Ukraine, and just to turn the narrative, they'll try and create an issue just to get rid of that media backlash, which is ha. coming in. Get rid of uh, Biden, they, get a fresh face. Thak, yeah. you know. If they lose in Ukraine, considering the fact, see, the, America has not won a war post-1945. Forget it. Okay. Uh, even if they have won a war, it really doesn't matter because their idea is not to win. The objective is to like perpetuate right. the war because so that, yeah. they are, so that the MI military industrial establishment keeps making those money. Now, if, they, if they suddenly, I would say, lose Ukraine, let's say if they suddenly decide to give up on Ukraine and if they say, Tika, yaar, jai, you're not doing anything about Ukraine. The two things, one, yeah, yeah, two things that they're going to do is they're not going to walk out just like that. They're going to put... Just like the way they are putting in enough money today so that Pakistan sustains, they're just going to put in that kind of a lifeline support in Ukraine so that Ukraine continues bleeding Russia and their arms supplies, you know, Increase. continue. Yeah. Okay. So Ukraine is not going to stop like that. Ukraine will keep on pestering and Ukraine is going to affect Russia, East Europe and West Europe, probably not the United States because they are somewhere off. Now, if that happens in Ukraine, they have got a China today, which they can think of opening up against. They have got a Taiwan front today, which they can think of opening up against. If for some reason they don't want to open up Taiwan, if they don't want to antagonize China directly, they might want to go back to Central Asia. If they go back to Central Asia, see, see within, within, are they within a reasonable limit, if you if you consider Halford McKinder and his heartland theory, whoever controls the heartland controls the rest controls of the world. world. Yeah. And 
Europe is something which is already in the pockets of United States or already in the pockets of the West. Asia is something which they have not managed to control ever. When it was Asia's time, it was controlled by Russia. It was partially controlled by the Brits. America never, United West never had it ever in their history where they were like kind of undisputed kings of the Asian landmass, which they badly want to because there are resources. There is another reason is that at no point in time, if you want to strive for a unipolar world, you would want a competition. Even if China were not in Asia today and if a China were in Africa today, America would yes. run in Africa and they would try to undermine China there because you don't want competition. Ah, it's a different matter that China is in Asia today. So America's focus is all the West's yeah, focus yeah. is again yeah, on yeah, Asia. Yeah. Hmm. So, and if your focus is on Asia, then you think of the fact that who is there to sort of support you unconditionally apart from the garrison state called Pakistan. Iran is not going to do that. Who else is left? Afghanistan, too early to say. You might build up a relationship with Taliban and you might again take the Taliban head to wine and dine with you like you did at the time of, you know, before 9-11 when you took them to Texas and Uno Cal, I think Halibut, uh, Dick Cheney was there or somebody. Yeah. Donald Rumsfeld was there. Okay, you wanted to open that oil and gas pipeline. So you quickly recognized the Taliban government and you took them. You can try that again, but as of now, it's not. So that could be one reason why they are throwing that lifeline to Pakistan, just to keep Pakistan breathing so that uh, you never know. We might need Pakistan back after five years. So if we need that, then huh, in the meantime, what would be of interest is what moves does China make with respect to Pakistan? That is something which remains to be seen. But in my mind, I don't think the army looks, uh, you know, at China very favorably. Well, there could be sections of differences inside the army no, as well. I agree with you because, you know, you had uh, Bajwa, if you remember, during the Islamabad security dialogue. Yeah. He was pretty categorical. He said, you know, you, you Westerners never gave us anything. When we came for engines, you said bugger off. When we went to Turkey to buy engines, you still said bugger off. Then what else do we do? We went to China. Yeah. And at the end of it, I mean, leave alone the, I mean, I'm considering Pakistani army to be a very professional force who bothered about their engines and this and that. I mean, where do their kids go and study? Where do their retired generals settle down? It's not in, it's not in downtown Beijing next to CCP Avenue, you know, opposite Xi Jinping's house. It's not that. They, they still need to go America, Canada, uh, England, and that's where, you know, the, the biggest thing is, see, the Americans have a big leverage that way. A lot of people don't realize this. But the Americans have a leverage. And with regards to the big bank balances these monkeys have abroad at the end of it, you know, and that leverage even the Americans have against the Chinese, you know, because all these CCP guys have mm. got back huge, thick, fat bank balances around the place. So you do it anything more, buddy, this all gets seized, nationalized. <laughs> yeah, which is what happened with Russia. With Russia. And that was a clear hint. And that's why a lot of these guys are a little, oh, oh, what do we do? And that's why I'm saying that there might be a chance where this particular decision, I don't know if America will actually ask this question, but I think the Pakistanis will have to decide this on their own. And when you see the narrative and the writings coming out of Pakistan and this, the noise, which is the TV, they keep talking about this. That Oh, hey, that is agree with agree with you. I mean, that's that's because, a, that's because, a... because see, you don't have an experience in running as a nation. Huh. You've been running as a garrison state. Your politicians yeah. are there to for the uh, for the world to see their showpiece materials. You know, running a state. I'm talking about hardcore administration. I'm talking about uh, production. I'm talking about economy. I'm talking about economic growth and development. Have Pakistan has Pakistan ever managed to do it on a sustained basis for a period of 15 to 20 years? Which is what you precisely need in a corporate setup for a bunch of people to learn a new. I mean, to master a new domain. You, I'm, I'm sure you would agree with me. <laughs> there is no disagreement. <laughs> so, 
if you have a, if you are existing as, as a country for the past 70 75 years where you've only been focusing on military adventurism you have never focused on nation building and when i say nation building i don't mean state building i mean nation building where you are there for your people where you're looking up yeah. so, exactly the basic amenities yeah basic sustenance your education system your college education system sanitation health, health yes, that, blah, yeah. blah blah okay you don't have it now if you really want to stand up and be counted amongst one of those nations which are showing growth indexes and things like that you have to work accordingly but where how would you work because you're not experienced in that so kitna bhi bolo i see it uh, a little it, i think it is a little difficult Yeah, of course you yeah. can get people from outside question is who wants to come <laughs> you know the, the 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 joke is and i and i keep saying this every time i cover pakistan's current problems i keep saying this yaar how can a country kind of say ki bhai imran khan de do hum baaki sambhal lenge what is his solution for pakistan there isn't any na he is not come out once and said ki bhai main ye karunga i will do this i will grow freaking wheat in front of my house fair enough okay one point chal you will feed five people jay congratulations nothing mm. i mean and that's the funny part of it even the other side when they 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 are fighting against the imran khan narrative none of them come out and say i'm karing ye kya yaar now shahbaz sharif exactly. is so happy that he's got this 3 billion dollar You know, loan. Oh ho! उसने मेरे को सुबह चार बजे फोन करा उसने मुझे तीन बजे फोन करा दिस हैपेंड मैंने उनसे बात करी इट वॉज अस ब्रेकर आई वॉज इन पैरिस आई वॉज दिस आई वॉज दैट बियॉन्ड वॉट अ कंट्री टू काइंड ऑफ इम्प्रूव नीड्स अ सिस्टेमिक चेंज इन टर्म्स ऑफ अ कंप्लीट रिलेंटलेस एफर्ट Yeah, you need you need serious. Uh, uh, I mean, brain even action. a lot of lot of people say India straightened up after ninety two. I don't think so. We straightened up somewhere in the end of two thousands, the first decade of the two thousand, and we realized that yeah, listen, dude, it's not going to work. These bad coffee we are doing, we are jumping on this side and that side. It's not going to work. Mm. And that's where the game started actually changing. So it took us twenty years to realize what we are doing is wrong. And even then, आज के दिन में भी there is a whole lot of areas where India needs to straighten yeah, their business, which we are not. Absolutely, absolutely. And and professionally, both of us are from the corp. From uh, you are from a corporate background. I am from a corporate background. You know how running an how tough running a simple yeah. chota organization is. And here you are talking about running an entire country. And organization may fir be you know there is efficacy, there is productivity, there is no democracy. Ah, you don't like the, you don't like the some rules of the numbers. Yeah, the yeah, rule of the dandas still works. Yeah, yeah. किसी का अच्छा नहीं perform नहीं किया भाई तू निकल यहाँ से. You can't do that in a democratic setup. So it's infinitely more complex and more tough. Now, absolutely, you got to be experienced in that. So I would say that even if you are like like as a CEO of running an organization, if you take about five years or ten years to gain experience to become a good CEO, as a as a leader of a country, ten years is nothing. you would take an you would need another 10 years because there are so many factors there are so many uncontrollable factors so and if you've not been doing this you've always been sitting on somebody else's money on on money just by the virtue of you being a geographical strip of a land which is of strategic importance because this happens to be a screwed up world where there is always a duel for access and control and balance of power as john mearsheimer calls it <laughs> if this is the world that you've been living in and you've had your chance where you've been lucky enough to be uh, somebody's uh, you know somebody's boy toy where some that somebody has been giving you money and sustaining you that still doesn't resolve your problem because what there, there's no there's no saying what happens tomorrow and which is what is has come to pass which is what you are asking me about and which is what uh, nobody at least i don't seem to have a complete concrete answer uh, but i can say this that because pakistan's existence has always been dependent on someone else's priorities pakistan's existence is going to continue on somebody else's priorities that somebody could be a us could be a china could be anyone 
you know, if it, Pakistan was a product, we could actually say, Pakistan, I live for someone else. Yeah. Tagline. Yeah. <laughs> Jokes apart. Uh, guys, like you know, as I, I was saying, thanks for the 131 likes. I'm sure we can get a little more out of, out of all of you wonderful people that are watching the show. Uh, please do subscribe to the channel. Those of you who, who are new. My apologies, all of you. I think my network gave me a little bit of a trouble. Sorry. I think uh, some Pakistani would have got inside my network and trying to trouble <laughs> me. <laughs> right. So as I was saying, guys, please do uh, subscribe to the channel. Those of you who are new to the show, please do subscribe. Uh, I will try and get him back for these lovely little long, very casual, very simple conversations where we talk about some very serious subjects, fireside chats, if I may. Let's get into your questions. You can contribute towards the Dev Talks efforts. The QR code is up there. You can become a member or you can send us a super sticker or a super chat. Thank you so much to Ishan for sending a super chat. He says, Jain sir, in my humble opinion, Pakistan was created as a buffer to India's development and growth by the West using certain elements such as separatists in certain Islamic communities backed by Jinnah. Just a comment if you would like to say anything on that. Mm, India's development was uh, not even featuring during the time Pakistan was created. The concept of Pakistan came into being sometimes during the 40s. Okay, uh, to give you a background, that was the time when Nick, there is somebody called Nicholas Pikeman who had wrote a book uh, on uh, where he has espoused the theory of Rimland. Rimland essentially means the European crescent and the, the areas adjoining the heartland. Pakistan is a part of the Rivland. To cut a long story short, Spikeman had said that the only way to control a Eurasian superpower, which was Russia, is that if you cannot control the central Eurasian heartland, which is the Asia, Central Asia and the Asian heartland, then the only way you can contain a Eurasian superpower is by controlling the Rimland. And geographically, West was controlling Spain, West was controlling uh, 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 Ottomans because Ottom Ottomans had collapsed. West was in fair good relationship with Iran, which is Persia. West had control over the Suez Canal. Canal. West only needed control in that strip of land, which is today Pakistan, in order to cut off Soviet Union's, Russia's access to uh, sea. So India's development uh, would not feature because India started developing, I don't know, sometimes in the 90s or in 2000. Uh, we have just begun developing. We are going to develop a lot more in the coming 50 years. But you know, during 1940s, India was uh, nowhere close to developing as a nation. Indeed. The next question is... Blinken went to China. Okay. Asked... Anthony Blinken went to China and asked Z to stop exports to Russia for some concessions. C will budge in, or do you, do the ex, do we expect a bigger war, World War Three? How does Pakistan fall in this scenario? I think I asked you this question that Pakistan would have to kind of make a choice. Any further mm. comments on that? No, see, uh, Blinken can travel wherever he wants to, but it's a very clear cut uh, uh, line of priorities which has been set by China and Russia as to what they want. And gone are those days when an American diplomat traveling to your country asking for things from you is going to result in a country saying, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full. So if you are sitting with a, a, a person, a statesman like a Xi Jinping or a Vladimir Putin or whoever, or a, even a Erdogan for that reason, <laughs> you, you have to have solid background, boss. You can't just go and ask somebody to stop export and stop import and expect that person to listen. America might think like that, but the world doesn't think like that anymore. Or do we expect a world war? Uh, frankly speaking, I don't expect a world war. Uh, in fact, world war is not probably no, is not a probability in the way we have seen a world war two and a world war one. What is a probability is a new world order coming up 
and there is a new world order coming up as we speak so over to you adi khushi asks and it uh, gives a very interesting thing say i guess westerners still need pakistan's existence but not its power or involvement in geopolitics i think that would be a very very good in my opinion yes. i think that's a very very spot on statement in terms of uh, the the positioning yeah. of pakistan in the world pakistan you as a jo- jo- you when you yeah 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 see pakistan's involvement mm-hmm. in geopolitics is something which they uh, utilize fairly to a fair extent during the afghan jihad pakistan's involvement in geopolitics is something which they utilize fairly because pakistan has been needling india through kashmir for a long period of long point in time pakistan's involvement in geopolitics when it comes to when it came to you know the nurturing of taliban and all america was absolutely okay with it so yes america made mistakes i hope they realize that uh, they would probably yes uh, uh, want pakistan to be there but and also want pakistan to be involved but in a limited sense in certain uh, geopolitical regions of the world you know the uh, um, interesting i think this this she's made a very interesting comment i i must say and it actually adds into a question which actually in a, uh, you know another lady in the show has brought up priyanka says uh, i heard pakistan was created to stop ussr but then why was bangladesh given to pakistan see any province like a hyderabad or a bangladesh or xyz going to pakistan was an additional uh, which one that the britons the british were not losing their sleep over and one that they were not very keen about you could think of a bangladesh as a bonus if a hyderabad were to go to a pakistan you could think that as a bonus the main the 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 basically the logic behind pakistan is the stretch that you see which still stands today as pakistan ye aur bhi acha hota but jammu and kashmir ka maharaja created a problem because pakistan wanted that access to indus river okay which they couldn't because this maharaja of pa- uh, kashmir created a problem and then there was this fiasco which happened and they had to send in their irregulars and you know what happened the kashmir issue i did speaking they yeah. were looking at a kashmir because kashmir was again the british had propped mm-hmm. up these rulers and they had very carefully extended the area of influence of kashmir from uh, kashmir to tashkurgan uh, but that suddenly they decide to be a part of india kya kare blockchain man i mean i i kind of have i agree with him and i'll i'll say why the relevance of pakistan <laughs> okay is to do jihad in xinjiang all banned terrorist groups will be sent to xinjiang province under the east turkestan so it's not turkmenistan brother it's turkestan islamic movement etim they've actually changed their name to uh, the turkestan islamic movement now it's called tim but you know this this is a very interesting statement which actually also covers another thing where the chinese have lost a lot of money in pakistan they they're getting their citizens killed and you know a whole lot of nonsense is happening there this is probably one of the biggest reasons that the chinese still support yaar tum rakho yaar you just don't break up because all these idiots are going to come inside and i'll have mm-hmm. a big problem so you take whatever mm-hmm. roll over solo whatever you need yeah they can see as far as uh, and he's fairly right as far as the rest of the world is concerned with uh, iran expressing i mean iran doesn't express any concern as far as uh, are, are you there There's some disturbance happening. yeah yeah okay with iran expressing concern about chinese treatment of the uighur with a uh, with a with a turkey expressing concern it really doesn't bother what bothers china is pakistan and pakistani non state actors uh, creating concern because there is a continuity there is a geographical continuity between china and pakistan and these guys are free to travel so yes china would do whatever it is within their limit within reasonable limit to keep pakistan uh, to keep the turkestani guys who are in pakistan to keep the uzbek guys who are in pakistan to keep the pakistani guys who are in pakistan whoever is thinking of any radical movement in or or, or radical disruptions in central asia and west uh, china the xinjiang province china would want them to you know kind of stick around and china would want them to be contained in pakistan and united states slash west 
would want them to fall out and move into Central Asia and create as much of a problem as they can. <laughs> that's the norm. That's the normal way of looking at things. Just, I mean, that's the equation. Abhi, what happens five years down? What happens seven years down? They would be ebb and flow. Sometimes somebody will prevail. Sometimes USA will prevail. Sometimes China will prevail. But that's the basic structure of Central Asia for you. And you know, you've got a religion which can be triggered, and you've got two big powers, two big regional powers, and you've got one power which is absolutely secure. Sitting in between two oceans, Atlantic and Pacific oceans, and they have all the liberty and all the bandwidth to create problems here, and they are going to create a problem here. Why? Absolutely. Because it is again. I'll take you back to somebody, a gentleman called John Mearsheimer, and uh, his theory of balance of power. Mm. Uh, the funda is that the rise of power is never peaceful. The rise of a global hegemon, the rise of a regional hegemon is never peaceful because there is always always someone who's holding on to that power. And that person is not going to let his power slip. Yeah. So, One of Deng Xiaoping's uh, statements, like, hide your strength, bide your time. Uh, a lot of people say there's another interpretation to it. The another interpretation is to beat away the current hegemon to establish your own hegemon. Yeah. But why would the current hegemon allow you to? Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be that, fighting. That's that's where balance of power comes in. Yeah. So today China wants to cut United States out. United States is not going to let China cut it out. It will do everything that it can, you know, uh, uh, imagine it can create, it can think of within its abilities to stall that rise of China. If that means. Absolutely. Releasing fundamentalists and releasing religious jihadis and radicals so and all. So be it. There's no rules. This is an interesting question. And Mr. VKC, I've been thinking about this for a while. I have not spoken about this as of now, but I think this is, this is a very interesting question. I will try and probably do another show, but your comments as well. Uh, how can India in its land fight against the open market? What are the future measures to prevent a money pool like incident? That's a, it's See, a very heavy question. I mean, it deserves future, a whole session on yeah. this one. Future measures to prevent Manipur-like incident, I am really not going to answer because that puts a lot of focus going back into the societies and the, uh, you know, the movement of different tribes. Why do tribes break into war and blah, blah, blah. So I don't think that's the, this is the right platform. We've already been at it for more than an hour. As far as India's uh, fight against opium is concerned, if you've if you've sampled, if you've traveled around, if you've been to Europe and uh, USA, you will see that India na abhi bacha hai. I mean, I I hope you can understand this bit of Hindi. India abhi bacha hai when it comes to drug consumption. India is not even a kid. There is a very uh, low market for these drugs. Only recreational drugs, the ones that you see in uh, you know elite posh clubs in Bangalore or Bombay probably, and the ones that we keep hearing about in Punjab and uh, other places. But yeah. um, uh, per, ca per capita drug, uh, hard drugs consumption of India is fairly low. Uh, but this is there's no need to be very boastful and very proud about all of these things. India needs to have, like a lot of other things in our domestic setup, we need to have very robust network. I am not bothered about whether India manages to control uh, opium flying into our uh, outer market, into, into international market, or probably being used at this point, I'm not bothered, probably being used as a transit point. But yes, we should definitely be bothered about the usage of all these hard drugs amongst Indian population, especially the young ones. And for that, you need a very, very drastic, very robust mechanism in place. Uh, that would be the, that has to be the initiative of the uh, the, the the domestic capital first of interior interior department ministry capital first of yeah Adi home ministry I'm so sorry that is going to be the initiative of the home ministry Adi can you hear me hmm I guess there is some kind of a lag can home you hear ministry. me now. Yeah, but uh, okay, there's some kind of a lack. No, that's that's something which we can. I think we've lost Adi once again.
sorry my network seems to be bugging me a little bit my apologies mm, we lost you again yeah i know it normally doesn't happen i do a show show a day i have not had this happen for ages chalo let's take last few comments and we'll we'll wrap up the show uh the west is not in a position to let pakistan disintegrate until they have the means to neutralize pakistan's nuclear weapons that's a very 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 interesting comment and there's another comment from waman who says all i think is pakistan created due to was created due to the failure of indian leadership uh of independence during 1947 indian leadership was complacent who could not say a no to the british i think that's that's very very interesting there's a last comment which is very interesting and uh, i want to kind of do some research i don't know if you know about this he says i heard uh, priyanka says i heard that uh, a divided india map was made in the 1850s which is available in britain the british museum and one was available in the lahore museum how much of it is true i, I mean i have no, no i have no i have no idea i'm uh, surely priyanka if you can just please write me an email i will try and do my best to research and see if i can find something but uh, at the moment i don't have any particular this things sarjeet thank you so much this has been a fantastic sunday afternoon i i wish we can do lots and lots more i think this was a very level headed conversation where we had uh, you know we we've, we've gone through a very interesting phase of history which is not mentioned not spoken about not kind of considered when you know by a lot of the people uh and i'm proud to say that on this platform a lot of uh, the people that come in are realists and that you know i'm glad to have you with us because these are the kind of realist discussions that we must be having in india to understand the real geopolitics of things it's not always emotions it's not always tacticals ki usne abhi kuch bol diya to humko ek ja ke usko thappad marna hai that is not how the world works the world works in long term strategic thought you need to win the war rather than a battle here and there on that thought thank you so much for joining me and sp spending your sunday afternoon looking forward for many more in the future till then jai hind thank you thank you for having me thanks to all of your viewers thank you